This week we're going to be talking about security in uh, building, uh, I guess, in an Angular app and in a backend REST API with Express. So we're going to be taking the demo app we've been building and we're going to we're going to add security to it. And this is a this is a really big topic, and we're going to touch on a lot of different concepts while we're doing it and a whole bunch of different technologies. And what I thought I would do before I dive in is I would just give you a quick overview of a couple of terms that I'm going to use frequently and that I find when I'm talking with students, they can be confusing. So a note about security. Security is something that you can't do too much of or you can't take too seriously. You're going to read about lots of different breaches at companies. Twitter's just had a really bad breach um, as I record this. So, you know, it's it's hard to get this stuff right. And it's the kind of thing that if you don't take it seriously, it will it will burn you. And the web has a lot of security features built into it and really good uh, standards and techniques and best practices that should be applied. And a lot of these are becoming more and more common. Companies are, you know, people building web browsers and so on are, are forcing people to take this more seriously because the attack, the, the attack surface of the web is so big. So this is by no means a complete discussion of security, but I want to show you how we could take what we're doing and we could start to layer in some uh, some security on top of it. Okay, so I want to. Um, I want to talk about three terms that are going to come up frequently and in the course of what we're going to be talking about. And those are, I want to talk about encoding versus hashing versus encrypting, salting, etc. So this is, this is where I want to begin. And I'll show you, we'll do a little bit of code to, uh, to demonstrate what's going on here. So the first one... The first one that we're, we're, we're talking about here is encoding. So encoding is when we take data in one format and we convert it into another format, but we do it in such a way that it's easy to reverse it. So there are no secrets here. The data is not secured. It's just, it's been rotated or it's been changed. It's been converted into a different format. So we often do this kind of thing when we need to embed data that we have into another data format. So good examples of this are if you send an email attachment, the email standard is for text-based, like all email is text-based. But if you want to put a binary file, like a zip file or something in an email, you have to encode that, that data, that binary data, back into pure text, into ASCII, so that it can be transferred. Or if you want to put data into a URL and the data has characters in it, say, for example, spaces or other special characters, and you need to you need to encode those characters so that it's possible for them to be embedded in this other format. So let's let me just show you a little bit of code for how you would do this uh, in JavaScript and Node. So if I have some text and if I wanted to encode this, one of the things I can do if I'm working in Node is I can stick it in a buffer. Um, so once it's in a buffer, I can, buffers are great because they let you work with binary data in Node. And I can convert that data back and forth from t different formats. I can encode it in different formats. Okay, so let me just dump this out. So if I, console.log this. So I could log my original text, but I could also convert this into another form. So base64 is a common encoding format that we'll use. So I'll take my buffer and I will convert it back to a string, but I'll ask that the encoding be base64. And we could also say, um, I want to encode it as hex. So I'm gonna, as a hex string. Or we could take this data and we could make it so we can put it on a URL. So we could say, if we're gonna put it on a URL, then we need to encode it as a component of a URI. So we'll, we will 
you know, so here's three different formats for encoding this. So if I were to, to run this, here's what we get back. So we have the original text and then we have three different encoded versions of it. And you know, the type of encoding that you choose is going to depend on the scenario, like where you're where you're embedding this. So for example, base64 isn't necessarily going to fit if you're going to put it in a URL because there are certain characters like slashes and different things that are part of a URL that we have to make sure go in there. Um, anyway, this this is uh, what we mean when we talk about encoding. We want to take data and we want to we want to put that data into a new format, typically so we can transfer it or embed it inside some other container. Okay. The second thing we're gonna talk about is hashing. So what you're doing when you generate a hash is you're taking a piece of data you're running it through an algorithm, and your goal is to create a fixed length, globally unique string, or globally, yeah, eventually you want a string based on the input data. So there's all different hashing algorithms that we can use, and these hashing algorithms are well known, so there's no secrets here. The idea is that if you put data into the hashing algorithm, you're gonna get out something that is mathematically guaranteed to be the same given a particular input. So if I put if I put the text ABC into a hashing algorithm, I'm always going to get back the same hashed value. Um, and this has some really useful characteristics for us. It lets us verify data. So hashes are often used as a way of saying, um, if I download some big piece of data or I transfer some data, how do I trust it? How do I know that the data that I'm uh, working with on the receiving end is the same data that you sent me? Well, one of the things you can do is you can calculate a hash before the data gets sent, and I can recalculate the hash on my side once I receive the data and I can compare them. So if I look at those, they should be, they should be identical. So an interesting thing about a hash is that it doesn't contain the original data. So the, and I'll show you this in a second, but when you hash something, you're not putting the data inside of the resulting hash. The hash is generated based on, uh, based on this. So let me show you some, some examples of what this, this would look like. So in Node, if you wanna do hashing, um, you pull in the crypto module which is built into Node. In later versions of Node, they've added it. So I have some data that I want to hash. So obviously that's not, <laughs> not really long. Uh, you could have megabytes, hundreds of megabytes, gigabytes of data. It doesn't matter how long this thing is. So I'm going to console.log again, and let's log a, I'll, I'll log the original data. But then I'll generate a bunch of different hashes. I'll show you different hashing algorithms. So really common one, SHA1. Um, I'm going to create a hash using the uh, SHA1 algorithm. So I have to I have to specify the algorithm I want to use. And by the way, you shouldn't use this anymore. So this algorithm has essentially been deprecated in favor of um, better hashing algorithms. So let's take our data and then let's once we have done this, it's gonna this is gonna create a binary uh, blob, which isn't really useful to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to encode that into something that I can read. So if I encode this into uh, base 64, let's say, then I'll be able to read it. So while we're doing this, let's also use a better hashing algorithm at uh, SHA-256, crypto create hash 256 update, pass in our data, 
and then spit out a base64 uh, encoded version of it. And I'll show you one more. MD5 is another one. There's all kinds of them. Crypto, create hash, MD5, uh, update data. Okay, so if I run this, I have two things. You can see that I have uh, my original, so this is my, this was my encoding, but down here is what I'm really interested in. So I have this data here, and then you can see that these hashes have been generated for um, using each of the different algorithms, and then they've been encoded into base64. Now, an interesting thing about hashes, I'll just comment this out because we don't need it right now, is if I change this data at all, so let's say, for example, I get rid of one period at the end, and I save this, and I rerun this, I want you to compare how, I'll just make this, if I move this up, compare how these look. So this data, this input data has been altered by, you know, one byte, like just one, one character is different, but look at how different these hashes are, okay? And if I made this really short, so let's say I just hashed uh, the letter A. you can see that the length of the hashes is, is still the same. So the data that you're putting in has no bearing on the size of the thing that you're getting out, which is different than when we did our encoding, because when you encode something, the data is still here. You can recover the data from this. I can, I can base64 encode something, and I can base64 decode something back into some other format. But with a hash, I can't run this back through an algorithm to get the letter A. There's no, it's a one-way algorithm. This is all you can do. All right, so encoding hashing. Now the third thing that we're gonna hear about is encryption. So when you encrypt data, you are converting data from one format to another, same idea as when we had encoding, but, um, you're trying to conceal its contents. So with base64, I want you to be able to decode it. If I, if I attach it into an email or something like this, or I put it on a URL, I want you to be able to reverse it without, without any issue. I want it to be simple to do. When we encrypt something, I want the intended recipient to be able to do that, but I don't want anybody else who might receive this to be able to do it. So I want to be able to, uh, I want to be able to scramble the contents in such a way that uh, the conversion involves adding some kind of a secret or a key. So I have an algorithm just like I did with encoding, but I also have this secret which goes together with it. So in order to be able to unlock this or decode it or decrypt it, I need to have the key or the secret at the other end. So two parties can share data over a uh, something like the internet, and it's safe to have that data travel across the internet and know that nobody, even if they intercept the data, they can't do anything with it unless they have those keys. So the key or the secret has to be kept very safe because if they, if anyone gets it, they're going to be able to, they're going to be able to decrypt the data. So we have to be really careful with what we do here. We now have um, we have something that we have to protect where we didn't have that with base64 encoding, for example. The encrypted data contains the original data. So in the same way that the data is in a base64 encoded string, the data is in an encrypted string because you need to reverse it to get it back out. So this is a two-way algorithm, unlike a hashing algorithm where I want to be able to check if something is legitimate, I hash it. With encryption, I want to be able to get it back um, so the, you know, the size of the thing that we're going to produce is going to be proportional to the input data. It'll be somewhat larger because it's been, um, the, it, well, anyway, the data, the data is going to be proportional in size 
to the input, whereas with a hash, it's going to be fixed, fixed in size. Okay, so another thing that's going to come up is we're going to talk about salting. And the idea with a salt, I mean, think about what, what is salt when you're cooking. Salt is this, is this thing you sprinkle on, hopefully not a lot, and you have a little bit of salt that gets added to whatever you're making, and it, it goes along with the thing that you're cooking or the food that you're eating. When we talk about salt with respect to encryption or hashing, what we mean is that we take an input, a piece of input data, and we add some extra bytes to it or some extra characters to it. We make it larger. So imagine you have a password. So like, um, I'm gonna do salting in a second, but let's say you have a password, which is, um, you know, like password one, two, three. So what I might do is I might come along and I might say, you know, I'm going to, I'm gonna add some kind of assault to this so that I'm gonna take your password and I'm gonna take the salt and I'm gonna combine them together like that. So before I hash it or before I encrypt it, I'm gonna put them together. Or I might put the salt in multiple times. I might do something like that. Or I might do this and then put your password one, two. I mean, you can do all sorts of things. You, have an, you essentially have, before you take the input data, you add to it, you make it more complex, you make it more random, you make it something which is harder for brute force attacks. So for example, a minute ago I showed you, <clears throat> excuse me, I showed you here with the letter A. So here's the letter A that's going through this hashing algorithm. So there's certain kinds of attacks where uh, what, what an attacker can do is they can just, they can hash well-known passwords or they could just hash the whole dictionary. They could hash every word in the language or every combination of characters. And it sounds like a lot, but if you have a fast computer, you can spit out all of these hashes. And then instead of having to know what the data was when it went in, because it's not possible to reverse it, I can't reverse this hash. However, the thing with a hashing algorithm is I do know that for a given input, the generated hash is always going to be the same. So if I hash everything, then I could compare hashes and I might be able to figure out uh, what's going on with your password. So what we do is we make it so that your password, even if it's short, can become much longer by salting. And we're extending, we're extending how this works so that we have a a more secure version of the password. So let's let's talk about, um, let me show you an example of how we're gonna do this in our code. So in our code, we are going today, we're gonna be working with passwords. And so when you work with passwords, you never wanna store a password in your system. Like I, every system I build, I don't want to have to keep, to keep your password because if I keep your password and my database gets hacked, then that's a pro that looks really bad on me, on my company. That's a problem. So I would prefer never to store, like store as little as you can. Don't store data you don't need. That's the first thing. But especially with passwords, I don't want to store your password. But we still need a way for people to be able to set a password, to be able to log into our system so we have a problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to hash and salt a password, and then we're going to store, we're going to store that instead of the password. So remember, hashing is taking an input, uh, like a password. We take a user's password. We're going to combine it with, uh, some salt. And let me just do this. Let, let's do this password plus your salt. We're going to run that through a hashing algorithm and we're gonna get some kind of an output. And the output that we get is what we're gonna store, okay? Now to do this, the best way to do this is for you to use something called bcrypt. And bcrypt comes in two flavors when you go to install it with Node. So you're gonna see something called bcrypt and you're also gonna see bcrypt.js. The difference between the two, they both implement the same encryption algorithms 
And the bcrypt version uses, um, uses C++ to implement it. The bcrypt JS is implemented 100% in JavaScript. So there are you know, reasons why you would pick one over the other. So the C++ version, the bcrypt version with Node.js, it's faster, but it requires a native build chain. So you have to have, in order to install it, you have to have a compiler. It has to compile some, some code to be able to do this. The bcrypt.js implementation is a bit slower, and um, but it also works in the browser, it works in Node, it works everywhere. So you, know, you can use both of them. So bcrypt uses the uh, Blowfish cipher or algorithm, and um, what it's going to do is it, it's kind of a funny hashing algorithm because the, the hashing algorithms that I showed you before, these hashing algorithms here are designed to run really, really fast. So if your goal is to verify data, and I give you a big piece of data, and you want to run it through a hashing algorithm, the faster that you can generate a hash, the better, because you want to have a unique identifier that goes for this data, but you don't want to wait forever for it to get generated. However, the bcrypt, bcrypt is designed to run slow, which sounds really weird, but it was done on purpose. It's, it was done so that it's harder for an attacker to generate, um, to try and do the kinds of attacks I just showed you. So the thing about computers is computers get faster. Uh, you know, Moore's law is such that if you look at the graph of computer uh, computing speed, you see that over time, computers get faster and faster and faster. And so these old hashing algorithms that we have that used to be slow, they get on newer hardware, you can do them in, in microseconds. Like these hashing algorithms take no time at all to run. Like when I run this, this, this takes absolutely zero time to, I just generated three different hashes here. It, it's lightning fast. So with bcrypt, what you wanna do is you want to figure out the sweet spot for how fast or slow it can run. And you wanna try and slow it down such that you're, you're doing more work. I'll show you what I mean. The code will, will make this a little bit easier. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, install bcrypt. And I'll use the uh, native version. And while this installs, let's start writing some code. So I'm going to pull in bcrypt. Like so. And I'm going to I'm going to show you how I would work with a user's password. So let's say I have a password. Like so. How are we doing here? Okay, bcrypt is installed. That's great. So the way that bcrypt works, bcrypt takes, uh, it needs three things. So bcrypt needs you to give it some text, so a password. And it needs to also have you tell it a work factor or how, basically how much, how much effort should it put into generating the hashes and the salts um, that it's, like the salting that it's gonna do. So bcrypt forces you to use a salt, like it, it's part of the algorithm. So it's gonna do the salt and the hash. It's, it's going to use the salt and the text that you give it in order to run it through its hashing algorithm to produce the thing in the, that you're gonna get in the end. Okay, so let's, so what would the code look like to do this? So I'm gonna show you sort of a, a, a simple version of it. So if I wanted to, um, So let's say I'm gonna print out the password and I'm also gonna print out uh, the hashed version uh, bcrypt. Man, my typing has not started yet today. bcrypt, I'm gonna hash. There's two versions of hash. When I do this for real in the code uh, in follow-up videos, when we start using this, I will use the asynchronous version of this 
because I don't want to block the main thread. But in this case, I'm going to use the synchronous version just because I want to. I don't care about uh, how long it takes. In fact, I want to show you what. So I'm going to pass in the password that I want to hash. And I'm also going to tell it how many rounds I want it to do for, of salting. So really what you're doing here, this is an exponential factor. So what you're really saying is if I give it the number one, for example, you're really saying I want to do, you know, this many rounds, two to the exponent one. If I say two, it's two to the exponent two, etc. So if I do one, which you would never do, and let me do this. So I'll save this, let's run this. So that was really, really fast. Okay, so let me just show you what we have here. So this is our, this is our, this is what our hash looks like. So the way this thing breaks down, uh, let me, let me show you here. So the, this breaks down like so. So we have a an identifier at the beginning, which says which hashing algorithm is being used. Then we have a, uh, a work factor. So the work factor here, it looks like it's set it to four, even though I set it to one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna increase the work factor in a second. So we have this work factor. And then we have, um, after that, we have, I don't know, I'm not gonna count these out exactly, but like 22 characters of this is the salt, and then 31 characters of this is the, is the hash. Now, I can change my password. If I change my password and like make it, you know, I'll, make, I'll do this, I'll do an S here. If I run this again, I'm gonna get a very different hash because as we said, hashing algorithms are such that they, these are globally unique strings that get produced when you spit this thing out. Okay, so you're not gonna do password equal one. So the thing about Bcrypt is you want something that takes a while to generate, something on the order of about a second. So I'm gonna time this. So if I do uh, console.time Bcrypt hashing, and I'm gonna do console.time end hashing. And let's run this. Okay, so this is taking 46 milliseconds to do, which um, is too fast. So what we can do is we can increase this. So let's bump this up. Let's go, let's go to 10. So if I go 10, it takes longer, like, you know, almost double. Let's go up again. So we do 11. So you can see that now, again, about double. 12. Now, right, it keeps going up, keeps going up. So we still haven't hit a second yet. So on my machine, I'm gonna go up more. If I do 13, I'm at half a second. If I do 14, it probably is about right. So yeah, just over a second here. And you'll see that it in, um, so the time that I'm, the time that I'm uh, putting in here, is gonna determine um, how long it takes, like how, how much work it's doing, the work factor that it's doing in order to, to produce, produce this. So this is good, this is good. We have something about a second. If I were to make this really big, like if I went up, you know, every, every step that I go up, it's gonna take longer and longer. Like you see how long it takes now. So almost two and a half seconds and you can keep going up as long as you want. So as computers get faster, Bcrypt is designed to allow you to keep it in the sweet spot of like, it should always take this much time in order to generate the, uh, the hash for your password. So the thing that I would store in my database is this thing here that it's spitting out. I wouldn't store your password. So I wouldn't even know your password 
at least in terms of my database and my backend, I'm going to be working with hashed, salted, hashed versions of it. Uh, that's what I'm going to stick inside of the database. Okay, so I just wanted to, I wanted to mention this before we got into it because we're going to be talking about encoding, hashing, salting, encryption. Um, we're going to be using a bunch of techniques to do this. So in the coming videos, I'm going to be working with a technology called Passport JS, and it's going to be used to help me um, utilize a bunch of the security authentication and authorization into our uh, REST API. And I'm also going to be showing you uh, showing you a standard called JSON Web Tokens. And we're going to be using JSON Web Tokens as a way of allowing our REST API to be accessed from different apps, like from our Angular app. So I want to, I want to work our way through, through doing this. In the next video, what I want to do is I want to start adding the um, ability for our backend to work with user accounts. I want people to be able to register and log in. And then I want to start slowly building up all the infrastructure I need to be able to secure pieces of that web app so that you can't, you can't work with the endpoints unless you have the appropriate authorization. You've been authenticated and I know who you are all the way into getting Angular to be able to do that. So we have a whole bunch of steps to try and uh, push this up into, into the app and I'll, I'll come back and talk about each of these in more detail as we go. So I'll see you in the next video.